Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Wednesday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 25th of July, 2018. Okay, especially with this episode, before we get started, before we, before Gavin and I talk about anything, we need you to like the episode. Really, I mean, yeah, like it. Share it, comment on it, subscribe to it, and for the first time in a long time, if you look in the show notes on YouTube, you're going to find a link where you can subscribe to the podcast, which is uh, being donated to us uh, by a loving oh, church good. in England. So we'll be do, doing podcasts now. Um, kind of cool. Mm-hmm. A, a, a lot of our younger people have been requesting it, and it's just uh, we don't have the, the donation uh, to do it, so now we do. Um, Gavin, you've been out for a week. You got some new parts. Tell us a little bit about your new hip. Oh, it's very exciting, Kevin. They've taken my my broken down, sin rattled body, and they have cut bits out of it. I don't know if they could do that to my soul quite as effectively, but for that we have to look to our Lord. Uh, I've got a new hip replacement. I'm I've sub- given up one kind of pain, the horrible arthritic I can't walk pain. The pain that makes me clutch your arm walking around Jerusalem yes. saying, "Carry me, Kevin." <laughs> yeah, that's right. uh, and, it, and it, it, I've swapped it for a nicer kind of pain, um, a post-operative, ouch, my wound hurts pain. <laughs> and sure. uh, um, so I'm, I'm six days after the operation and I'm, uh, I'm struggling around uh, getting better and I'm very grateful. That's good. Yeah, you've had quite a year. I mean, you've done your, your retina a couple times. You've got a new hip. So uh, things are moving on. Fourth, fourth operation in eight months. <sighs> <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, at our age, I feel so old. I don't. Uh, people have uh, certainly heard that George got sepsis. He was in the oh, hospital no. for uh, four or five days. He's home now, recovering. I hope to get him on on scripted on Friday. He wants to do it now. He wanted to do a, a recording last <laughs> week. I said, "You're kidding? No, I, oh, I'm fine. Really? No. Thank you, George. We're going to hold you off till Friday. So, um, let's move on to the news." Uh, if people remember, we've been talking about uh, Bishop uh, Peter uh, Ball from uh, Gloucester. Gloucester. How do you pronounce? It? He, he was Bishop of Gloucester. Gloucester for a long time. You call, you call it Gloucester style. Gloucester. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. Uh, we've we talked about him for a long time, uh, and this is you know certainly cost uh, the church um, a lot of shame. And uh, Gav and I are going to talk about this, but before we talk about this. Oops, sorry. I need to let the audience know that uh, we are biased in the story because I know Lord Carey. I know uh, his son, Andrew Carey. I will be in an event with Lord Carey in, in September. Um, I never met Peter Ball. I don't really know a lot of the whole story and timeline. That's what we have Gavin for. Um, and the Careys watch the show. So, you know, we have to understand you know, a little bit about how Gavin and I deliver uh, what's been happening over the last couple of days from uh, the Church of England. Gavin, before we start, let's get a little history on Peter Ball and uh, his twin brother. T- tell us a little bit about the history of <clears throat> becoming a bishop and, and what we know. Well, uh, so I should, I should make a disclaimer too. Uh, I knew Peter Ball. I played squash with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Um, and since since we're going to find that um, some of the narrative of this is about uh, young men who stood and prayed naked with him, I remember we stood naked after showering, after squash. Um, it, I suddenly realized that the, the, the kind of parallels and connections go a long way. Um, the, the two Ball brothers were celebrities in the Church of England. Um, the Michael Ball, which is not Peter, uh, was in fact one of the chaplains at Sussex University where I was a chaplain, though just before me. And he became Bishop of Truro. And his brother Peter Ball, who we're going to be talking about, became Bishop of Lewis and was my suffragan bishop for a while, and then Darcy's and Bishop of Gloucester. They were, they were uh, particularly Peter, charming, charismatic, passionate Christians. They started their own monastic order within the Church of England. Um, they were dynamic, admired, loved, and very effective, as far as everyone could tell. Mm-hmm. 
And then, um, shortly after becoming a diocesan bishop of Gloucester, like his brother, Peter Ball was accused by a number of young men of acts of gross sexual indecency. And the young men in question were mainly under the age of 21, so they were, they were minors, they were technically children. Uh, much of the Christian world found it very difficult to believe that these were true. And indeed, right up to very recently, the narrative was the balls have been stitched up. They were traditionalist Anglo-Catholics against the ordination of women. And uh, one of the narratives put around by, by them and their friends was they had been unfairly and improperly accused. Anyone who loved them, admired them and, and respected what they had achieved would have wanted to have believed that. So one of the things, so now what we have is um, because of the growing issue of sexual abuse, child sexual abuse throughout society, an independent uh, inquiry into child sexual abuse has been set up. Well, now uh, let's, and, let's give the year. We're going back to the 80s here. Uh, going back, well, well the, the arrest took place in about, in about 1993, I think. Okay, 93. But, you know, this is when the Roman Catholic Church uh, throughout the 80s was... Uh, completely decimated by these same types of accusations, uh, they were in and court. is being uh, and yeah. is being today. I mm -hmm. mean, today the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Washington mm -hmm. is being accused uh, of being a, a leading homosexual activist who has promoted his homosexual partner's entire office. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church is experiencing a a different variation of this, mm -hmm. but. Uh, because the Church of England is a state church, the state has come along and is cleaning up its act for it in the sense that this inquiry has been launched to understand child sexual abuse throughout society. But, it, but it's looking particularly at the Diocese of Chichester, which is where Peter Ball happened to be a suffragan. And it's decided to spend a whole week looking at the Peter Ball issue to see what lessons it can be learned. And it's on day three of it today. OK, so how did we, how are we bringing Lord Carey into this? Um, Lord Carey, former Archbishop of the Church of England um, and Archbishop of Canterbury, gave testimony on what he knew and what he did uh, yesterday uh, or the last couple of days. And uh, we're going to talk a little about the testimony because um, at best it's, it, it's hard to watch and hard to understand and hard for me to reason uh, with what happened. Um, Let's talk a little about the, the testimony. Kerry was given information about uh, Bishop Ball, and this information he had was pretty devastating. The, the, the difficulty is, <clears throat> there is so much that's difficult in this. Yes. Uh, Lord Kerry was being asked for detailed information about memories now that go back 20 years. The, the problem was, and this is what we covered this when we looked at why Justin Welby removed his license. Mm -hmm. The problem was that Lambeth Palace had six letters which made accusations that corroborated each other of a pretty uh, explicit kind. And the question that Lord Carey was being asked to answer was, if you had these in your possession, why did you not act, first of all, quickly, definitively, and permanently. Uh, Lord Carey made many apologies and said, we handled this badly, I handled it badly, my team handled it badly. Um, he, he didn't help himself by saying that uh, I was busy at the time with Diana's divorce and the ordination of women. Um, uh, it, it may have been true, that may be his own experience, that his hands were full. And it's certainly the fact that an Archbishop of Canterbury has the most enormous remit uh yeah, and in terms of his worldwide responsibilities and and then is required to deliver globally and at the same time as uh a senior bishop in, in the church of england however the problem was the, the questions lord Carey were asked were why didn't you why didn't you understand what was going on earlier than you did and do you still understand what's gone on the, the, the real difficulty that Lord Carey had trouble answering, and I think, don't think he did answer it, was that, um, and I, 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 you know, I apologize for the explicit nature of what I'm about to say, but given that the defense has always been from the Ball brothers, we have been misunderstood, nothing happened that was very bad, 
Um, so the defense has always been that what Peter Ball was doing was was kind of in-depth Franciscan spirituality. At one moment, pe people will know St. Francis tears off his clothes in public because they, they were paid for by his father. And he walks naked out of the magistrate's court uh, in Assisi and begins a, a, a new life with, with nothing on him. And everyone goes, oh, my goodness, you know, this is either you know, exhibitionist or, or incredibly holy. No one quite knows how to make it. Well, the, the trouble is the balls, or rather Peter Ball, took the nakedness of St. Francis as a, as a spiritual paradigm to be copied. So you might say, well, this is pretty dangerous stuff. And indeed it is. Well, no, it's, it's, problem, it's, it's horrid. You can't use that excuse. Well, inviting, inviting young men to take their clothes off in order to pray better with you uh, it, it crosses the line in so many difficult places. But the problem was, one of these letters that Lord Carey had were, were from parents. Several of the letters were from parents. So, I mean, this, this makes it much worse. Um, and they complained that the position of their son and invited him to masturbate in front of him. Uh, and and demanded I, 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 right now the audience is shocked. Good, you should be absolutely horrified and shocked. So, given that the defense the last since nineteen ninety three has been well, Peter Ball was accused of things that weren't true. They were exaggerated. He was pursuing Franciscan spirituality. He was misunderstood. Um, this letter, which is corroborated by the others. Um, was in Lambeth's possession. So the question is, if you have a letter like that, does this not require you to act decisively and immediately? And 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 having had that letter and read it and 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 talked to Peter Ball himself, one of the things Lord Carey did was to write a letter to the Diocese of Gloucester after Peter Ball had been suspended, saying, "We do pray with us that Peter Ball recovers his lost reputation." Now. It was not clear how, when Lord Kerry was asked to square that circle, um, it wasn't clear how he did it. The, the fact is, a number of things are going on at once. This is a tale of competing contradictions. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the problem is that the balls were assiduous in in defending themselves. They had charm, they, they had spirituality. And they had friends. They well, had they, plenty they had, of people see, who defended them and said, no, you don't understand. These guys are walking saints. They had more defenders by by a million times than they had accusers, and that really I, hurt. I'm not, you know. <clears throat> I'm not going to make any, any excuses for George no, Carey, but but no. but one of the things one one needs to understand is English culture. If if I was an archbishop who had grown up in Dagenham, East London, where you don't get many, if any, archbishops apart from Lord Carey, and I was dealing with a bishop who who had. Chief Justices of Appeal, MPs, and Prince Charles amongst their notable friends. Um, it's hard, it would be hard, to to deal with the pressure. Now, one of the things that Peter's brother did was embark upon a letter-writing campaign so assiduous and so corrupting that the policeman in charge of it very nearly arrested his brother on the charge of perverting the course of justice. He said it came within a whisker of it. Um, because one of the things that happened was a huge campaign saying Peter's been misunderstood. Now, um, the, so, so, so Lord Carey had a problem. He couldn't seem to get his head around the fact that this charming, powerful, uh, popular, immensely popular man, popular, I think, because the Church of England sensed it was going down the tubes. And it said to itself, if only we had more bishops like Peter Ball, well, you know, we'd be able to reverse things, not knowing that Peter was a very mixed bag. Well, okay, um, well, let's. I, I want to interject here. Of the rules of the time and the power the the Archbishop of Canterbury had at the time, what could Carey have done right away with all this information? Well, Does he have the power to suspend him or make sure he no, doesn't ever serve again? Suspend interestingly license? enough, well, but you've you've hit the nail on both its heads. Um, Lord Carey made the point that he that he had influence but no power, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, he didn't have power to suspend him. So there was a big, big, in terms of what happened, uh, Peter Ball resigned as a kind of uh, deal in order to only receive a caution and not, and not at that time be prosecuted. He was later, and more recently, he was prosecuted and sent to prison. Mm -hmm. But at the time, he was let off with a caution. On the grounds he resigned because the church needed to be dealt with. But the problem was he wanted to be back as a bishop. Now, 
George Carey clearly found it immensely difficult to digest, um, I think, the complexity of the gay of the gay underworld, uh, the duplicity of a man who was both a hero uh, and had committed a very serious criminal offence at the same time. But the point of where I think George Carey made a mistake that he will regret for a very long time is that under enormous pressure from the letter writing brother, Bishop Twin, Michael, uh, the question was, could Peter Ball be allowed to act as a bishop again? And what they did was they gave in to him. Uh, in fact, George Carey's chaplain, a man called Colin Fletcher, who later became Bishop of Dorchester, sounds like almost the only sane voice in Lambeth saying, you do realise you're being manipulated, bullied, pressured, blackmailed, you know, stop it already. However, uh, Carey didn't stop it and he gave way to this pressure and so allowed Peter Ball allowed Peter Ball to, 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 to come out of his enforced retirement, having accepted a caution for gross indecency with, with young people, and take confirmation services at private boys' schools. And the lawyer said to him, did it not occur to you that this was, that this was bringing the fuel and the fire too close together? And George Carey, perhaps lacking the imagination that some of the rest of us have had by experience, said, I, I didn't see how anything could go wrong. He wouldn't have any private encounter pastoral encounters with the boys and the lawyer said well but let's say he goes into a boys school and preaches an emotional sermon and some boys say oh this man's a great christian can i write to him can i phone him can i can i enter into some kind of of um, correspondence with him you know what did the, what would the church have done to ensure that didn't happen the answer was you know nothing well we didn't think about that so so the, the to my mind the two very serious charges that were not dealt with was writing a letter praying for the restitution of a reputation that was clearly unreconcilable and giving him permission to minister as a confirming bishop uh, in adolescent boys schools um and th this is you know this is really rather sorry my, my cat is complaining that's right now did bishop uh ball at any time repent publicly <sighs> What Bishop Ball did was to say two things at once. He said, I'm extremely sorry. I've been mis I have been misunderstood. I'm sorry that people have, have misunderstood me, have been hurt. And pity me, I have been very badly done by. And, and, and so one person said, it came, you know, one side of his mouth came, I'm very sorry. Another part out of his mouth came, hey, I'm the, I'm the victim here. Now, the, in terms of victims here, one of the young men killed himself. I, I, I find the notion of using suicide as a uh, moral lever abhorrent because we can't know what causes people to kill themselves and there's a kind of symbiotic uh, confluence of circumstances um, which may have to do with depression, insecurity, sexuality. You simply can't take a, a tragedy and say this was a component that caused it. However, one of the young men, a man called Neil Todd, did kill himself. And the others talk about their sense of fragility and woundedness. One of the men who gave evidence was somebody who described it, who's a, who's a priest. And he described two things, the, the abuse that he had at Peter Ball's hands, but much, much, much worse, he said, was being dismissed as a troublemaker by the church when he asked the church to deal with it. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that it's only when you hear the stories and you hear the immense distress caused by some of these people that you say, we're not doing victim culture very well uh, today, but there are points when we have to pay attention to victims. And the Church of England has just not managed this throughout this whole saga in the last two years. Although safeguarding has been ratcheted up enormously, there's a whole team of people at Lambeth the people who are dealing with the victims are being complained against bitterly by by those who have been on the receiving end of abuse saying we didn't like the sexual abuse in the first place we're really hating this institutional abuse you're putting us through now it seems it's it, it's almost impossible for an organization to learn to manage to deal with human pain of this kind without covering itself up in some kind of way so um so we're when you when you ask a question, which I'm taking a long time to respond to, did Peter Ball repent? The answer was uh, uh, only in a completely inadequate way up to this date. Yeah. 
Hell no, I would say. Oh boy, this is a mess, Gavin. This is this is horrible. Um, this is what we know up to this point. Obviously, you and I will talk about this a bit more next week. And these are not the type of episodes uh, Gavin and I like to uh, to report on. Uh, we prayed extensively before we got to this because this is hard. Um, questions I have: Has the Church of Ling- England learned anything uh, from this? There are, there are a number of very big big issues for us to work through, and I, I think one of the things it's incumbent upon us to do is to do is to do more than report scurrilous news, but to mm-hmm. try and bring some kind of wisdom to bear. If if the church hasn't got wisdom to bring to bear at the point of maximum human frailty, then then we're not doing very well. I think I have a few observations. Um, the first is that one of the reasons this was a mess was because uh, George Carey said he found it impossible to believe that a bishop would behave like this. Well, well, then, then he hadn't done enough parish work. No. Um, because... Uh, and, and, and you know, the fact is, no one is without sin. We are all flawed, uh, and, and there is a, a huge gap between the appearance that we all of us present and and who we really are under the direct scrutiny in the presence of God. Uh, so, a, a, a proper understanding of of sin and humanity uh, ought to make us more wary than the church has been so far. A lack of wariness that um, using both class and spirituality, the Ball brothers both capitalized on. The next thing I think we should say is that that at the time the church found it very difficult to deal with um, homosexuality and and children. Uh, society is is terribly anxious that anyone should make a link between homosexuality and paedophilia. But the fact is that there is a very powerful overlap and it, it, it came together particularly with Peter Ball's penchant for teenage boys. So rather than, than, than work through the implications of this, what the church has done, it seems to me, is to say it's too difficult to recover the integrity of a biblical and traditional sexual purity. Um, let's go with the flow. And so one of the things that Justin Welby is busy doing is presiding over a church that has abandoned the quest for sexual, psychological and spiritual purity and instead is settling for the agenda that a very sexually confused and hedonistic society is pushing very hard. And down that way, complete disaster lies. I mean, it's one thing to lose your integrity as a church because you mishandle people because we mishandle people. It, it's another thing to simply close your eyes to what the Bible and tradition says about what God wants and what's good for people and to say, well, we'll take the easy route, the broad route that leads, as Jesus warned, to hell. I, to hell. I think the third thing I'd say is that uh, much of this is based on an inadequate Christian anthropology. What, what all of us want to do is to divide the world into good people and bad people. And when we say good people, we say, oh, look, there's a good person. That's a relief. When we say a bad person, we say, look, there's a bad person. Steer clear of it. Uh, what we find in the Gospels is Jesus saying, um, when, when the disciples say, Lord, you know, bring everything to completion quickly now, the, our Lord says, it's all going to have to go right to the finishing tape. And only at the finishing tape will we know how the weeds and the tares and the corn stand. And what I think that means is that we will find people who are very complex mixtures of holiness and perversity. And we're just not going to know very often how those combinations stack up. Uh, and we're going to long for people who are obviously bad and long for people who are obviously good. But, but the Gospels require us uh, to be both wary and hopeful. Wary in the sense that we're not going to believe that anybody is beyond reproach or beyond sin, and hopeful because um, the way through this is is just as you said, it's real penitence. Mm. So all of us say, you fouled up, I fouled up, we've come to the foot of the cross, we say sorry. And now the great gift the Christian community has is to carry people through repentance to forgiveness and a new life. One of the things, there was a theological exchange between the uh, Queen's Council leading the inquiry and the Archbishop. And she said, um, why were you so keen to offer restitution to Peter Ball? And he said, well, because we believe in forgiveness. And she said, excuse me, I, I don't know the Bible very well, but I understood that 
one of the core principles of the church was you can have your forgiveness but only after you repented when did peter ball ever repent and the answer and, and clearly the answer was well he doesn't seem to have done that now it's up to the lord to know why why peter ball uh is so determined to defend himself in the eyes of the world uh but 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 you know this is the way, this is what the christian church brings it brings forgiveness uh, it, it brings a, a sane understanding of the complexity of human nature and the unending love of god and it applies the hope in those circumstances where people own up to who they are and then ask for help to change their behavior but if i if you if you fall short with either of those two things and you end up with the kind of aberrant situation that the ball the ball, the ball, the ball, tragic ball saga represents for the church, and the great danger is going to be that the um, that the state will look at the church and say, "Well, you handled this really badly." I mean, it doesn't matter that um, uh, that, that Diana and Charles were uh, getting divorced. It doesn't matter that you were going through a seismic change of theology over gender and sexuality. Um, you you really made some serious mistakes here, and therefore we're going to take over your policing. And one of the things that will come out of this is going to be uh, almost certainly there will be a statutory duty to report anything to the to the state and the church's capacity to offer grace and forgiveness will be will be seriously curtailed at the hands of a of a state agency i think and th this really matters because one of the things that the church has faced all the way through the years from from beckett and henry ii through henry the eighth uh through through to 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 the bombing of German cities in in the, the Second World War has has been the church needing to have an in, a moral independence uh, to say to the state, "We think you're getting it wrong." As soon as it says to the state, "You can be our moral policeman," this is a an up an upending of the real um, hierarchy of values that that we're here to live out, and a, a really serious diminution of what the church is. The role of church is supposed to play in society. Well, I would say that this is just making official what's been happening over the last dozen years anyway, uh, or 20 years. The church has adopted uh, you know, what's happening in the society of England as its moral cult. And yep. um, this isn't going to be any different. That just makes it official. You know, it's we, one, we, one yeah, more step to making it, it official. You're just signing the dots and... Uh, and T's and we are now official uh, you know proprietors of what the state wants to teach mm. and wants us to believe yeah it's sad it really is well Gavin uh, we've given our our listeners viewers a, a good uh, 20 minutes of or 30 minutes oh we've talked forever you have uh, <laughs> this is horrible <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Before we started, we prayed. Uh -huh. You know, this is this is going to be a hard one because of who we know, what we know, um, and uh, the the grossness of the story, uh, the horridness of the story, um, and how it's going to affect church, how it's going to affect how people see Christ, uh, how people uh, will be turned off by. Religion, church, Christianity, but, but 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 you see, Kevin, I think this goes to the heart of what I thought was my in my, my last remark. Mm -hmm. I, I, indeed, if if we set ourselves up as a community of, of of saints and virtuous people, then this is this is truly gross. It's really horrible. But if we say to the world, look, you know, we're as messed up and as and as broken and as tempted and um, as fragile as anybody, but the difference is we're heading in a different direction and we fall over flat on our faces at every point through our lives there's a danger of falling flat on our face, but the Lord picks us up forgiveness, forgives us and invites us to continue the journey. Then, it's, then that's where the hope comes in. If at any point we pretend we've either made it or, or we're beyond failure, uh, you know, we then move into, into Phariseeism, which is not Christianity. Yeah. But the, the great the great news is uh, there is forgiveness for Peter Ball. The, there is forgiveness for everyone in the commission. There is I would say the great news is there's repentance and forgiveness. Uh, predicated on our are asking for it yes and are, and are being willing to pay the price of trying to of trying to change behavior i mean that mm. that's that's why this whole 
selling ourselves into the kind of current sexual mores won't work because mm. at, at no point do Christians get off the hook of of responding to the grace which is the work that God does with the work that we do which is to say I'm going to go on trying to change my behavior I'm Kevin Carlson I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 422 of Anglican Unscripted. And if it's a podcast, um, Kevin and I don't really have the faces for television. No, we don't. You are blessed if you're watching the podcast. Mm-hmm.